The Redfern Aboriginal Medical Service, or AMS, has celebrated 45 years of community service, looking back on past achievements and forward to future ventures, which includes new partnerships within the Land Rights Network. I'm just over the moon to be part of this day. You know, most of the day was around Naomi and, you know, and the AMS and all the old people, not I shouldn't say old people, but all the founders from way back then. And, and it's that, uh, their staunch uh, ideology and, and how, what they stood for back then, um, you know, we've managed to carry that through to, that, to today. And that's the beauty of it. And I think today was about educating or letting the younger ones know this is what we had to go through to get to this. Established in 1971, the Redfern AMS was the first community controlled health service created in response to a call for quality medical care for Aboriginal people. Originally a shopfront volunteer service staffed by non-Indigenous doctors, nurses, nuns and students, the AMS has now grown into a holistic health provider, including medical, dental, public health and outreach services. We always want to set up our own health services. It was getting to the right time, getting the right people. Um, the community in Redfern was really uh, most adversely affected. But as Sol has said, the legal service found that a number of the people had hearing problems. They couldn't hear their sentences. They would plead guilty when they were not because the questions were muffled. The language used was not easily understood and so on it went. Um, we found the health of people, people had short lifespans. The infant mortality at that stage, infant mortality rate was about 33 per thousand compared to the Australian, which was about 10 per thousand deaths. Um, short lifespans, illness, kiddies with, oh, just bronchitis, kiddies with ear infections who would be treated with antibiotics and then they'd get better, but then three weeks later, they'd be right back to being sick again. Uh, so there was a crying need for us to set up our own services. And we all used to work as part of the celebrations, a panel and Q&A was held at the Charles Perkins Centre Auditorium, honouring those that helped found the service. We're so proud and honoured to, you know, to lead the way uh, in Aboriginal affairs, basically. Not only in Redfern, not only in New South Wales, not only across Australia, but internationally. We have an, an international reputation, uh, a national reputation, and uh, people look to us for guidance. And uh, we've got a footprint right across Australia. Uh, in Aboriginal health and uh, it's because of the elders that have passed and the current uh, older population who, uh, you know, they're, they're the founders of the AMS, the founders of the legal services, the children's services and so on and uh, we stand on those shoulders and those and, and beyond that is basically making changes and the influence that, uh, that those elders and the founders had on politicians and parties and the unions as well to help us uh, get the funding that we seek to, to have better health outcomes for our people. The panel also heard from a number of distinguished speakers with fond memories and praise for the AMS's long-term achievements. And the great humanity that I saw there and the wonderful work that was being done, not only in terms of medical and nursing care, but giving the clients, the Aboriginal people, a sense of pride to stand up and be counted. And I think that the 45 years in which this great service has been going has encouraged so many people. One of the greatest sources of pride is to see the ever-increasing number of young first Australians going through all the professions, graduating in medicine, nursing, social work, law. It's ever expanding, thank goodness. And also having the heritage 
of the longest living culture and civilization on the planet. Paul Torzillo is a senior respiratory physician and intensive care physician at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. It's a career he says he owes to the Redfern Aboriginal Medical Service, where he first began work as a volunteer driver. Look, I've spent, you know, the whole of my working life hanging around Blackfoot. So I went on the Gurindji demonstration in 69. And, and then in 1970, you know, I sort of rolled into Redfern really because of Peter Thompson. And I met this whole group of people who were there setting up the legal service and the medical service and, you know, Jenny and Bronwyn and um, Lynn Thompson, you know, who hasn't been mentioned, and Bob Belair, you know, I suppose those two especially taught me a heck of a lot in those first few years, and I was, you'd hang around the Empress on Friday and Saturday night, as Solly said, and sometimes you'd be there looking out sort of for the legal service when people got busted, and sometimes you'd be picking people up, taking them down to the medical service, and one incredible achievement is they're still in business. And lots of Aboriginal organisations aren't. And while all of us like to think about um, those glorious early days, I think the reason the medical services in business is it's changed with time and it's changed not just because people wanted it to but because and it had to. And it now it's in business because it delivers high quality services and it does a whole lot of things that we never even thought about in 1971. Um, and it does them well. And, you know, that's an incredible achievement. I think... I just want to say something about doctors. You know, one of the, thing, one of the many things that Fred Hollow said which was very important to me when I was a medical student is what we need in Aboriginal health, we need the best doctors, not the doctors who can't get a job anywhere else. And... Um, <laughs> And that was important to me in my career. And I think the medical service was lucky because early on it had these people like Andrew, Ferry Gunsight and Mick Asher and Ross McLeod and, you know, a whole lot of other people that I either can't see or aren't here. And, uh, um, and they continue to have those sort of quality people. I think that's a really big achievement. And um, lots of the work that I've gone on to do in other places and especially in Central Australia in the last 30 years... You know, I'm still heavily influenced by lessons I learned at that time and people I met. It's almost as if if you could guess anybody that's going to be in a decision-making position, whether it be in government or in non-government non organisations or in, the, in, in business, who are going to have any interaction, that's m most of them, with the future of Australia, spend some time in a community-controlled organisation like the AMS to learn how to make change. You, everybody that I saw... Everybody I worked with gave me things. <coughs> I was very lucky to work there, and thank you very much. The CEO of the Casino Aboriginal Medical Service, Steve Blunden, says the service has led the way for the creation of many other Aboriginal community-controlled health services in New South Wales. Like, you know, we've helped set up Coffs Arbor, Nambucca, Foster Tongue Curry, um, even with support of Redfern, they set up Grafton with the asbestos um, issue up there and, um, and Casino. Um, and ultimately, um, we won't stop there. Um, I think as one person said, from little things, big things grow. Because I'm sure the other AMS CEOs and boards in other parts of New South Wales, they did the same thing. They spread their wings to support our mob. And it wasn't just about the towns we lived in, it was about all of our mob needing that support and help. As the panel wound to a close, one of the AMS founders and former CEO, Naomi Myers, was honoured with the unveiling of her portrait as part of the occasion. Looking ahead to the future, the service will continue its core business and expand into new partnerships with external services, like the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, to address the rehabilitation of people with drug and alcohol issues. But one of the things that we're currently working on is, is, is the Land Council has some land up there in, uh, in uh, Hawkesbury and uh, 
Well, Wiseman's Ferry, and we intend to set up a, uh, a rehab. Uh, they'll supply the land there, we will supply all the, the, the medical needs and whatever, and, and there'll be other partners that will come in, both government and non-government. Um, and what, it, what, what it'll be something, once we work it out, but our, our, uh, it's big enough to have a drug rehabilitation or ice rehabilitation as well as alcohol rehabilitation, but it's good to send people away and all that and get them well for a few months and all that, but we need something for them to come back so when they do come back out of that, their kids don't know here's this stranger in them, you know, because I've only seen them high on dope or, or, uh, or full of grog. Laverne Belair agrees and says growing relationships within the Land Rights Network and other Aboriginal services are key to Redfern AMS continuing to deliver relevant community health services. You know, because ice is a big problem, uh, we can't possibly solve it ourselves. Uh, so we're partnering up with the, our local Aboriginal organisations and the Land Council is going to be a big part of that as well. I believe we've got people out there community with the fire in the belly um, and we'll stand up and we'll prove to government that um, they cannot operate and provide service to our community without the AMS is providing the support there and it's simple as that.